Welcome to Tabletop Tommies. I'm Johnny. And I'm Phil. And in today's episode, we're talking through the new FAQ. Finally got one. Hurrah! <laughs> so when we go through it, we're not going to go through every single FAQ because that would take a week. Oof! <laughs> We're just going to go through anything that's changed since the last FAQ and sort of give our thoughts and opinions on it. So I've got to say, my view on it is that most of the amendments, corrections, clarifications are pretty good. There isn't a huge amount of game changing stuff, which is usually quite a good thing in a Warlord FAQ. There are a couple of errors that I spotted, though, which is... Like, you've had, what, 18 months to prep this? Come on, team. In in what sense? Well, <laughs> spoilers. There's a, couple of, <laughs> there's a couple of blunders I've seen, and I'll point them out as we go through. Right, okay. Because I, I don't want to spoil it. Okay. What was your thoughts on it, Phil? It was, it was fine, yeah. I mean, I, I was a bit like, yeah, okay. You've clarified a few things. You've added some nice units, which definitely will benefit some people. I thought there's quite a lot of changes made to some of the campaign books recently, which was a bit a bit interesting to see the amount of, of you know corrections that needed to be made for some of them. Mm, but yeah, I thought that. Yeah, I, I thought yeah, in terms of clarification and so on, it, it was fine. There, like you said, there aren't any major major rules changes or or moments where you read it and go, "Hang on a moment, that contradicts something else in the FAQ," or actually contradicts what was written in the rule book mm. and hadn't been errated. Yeah, there wasn't. There was nothing like that. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Unless you're about to show us something which I haven't spotted. No, okay. the the blunders I'd spotted were more just like piddly little things where you just think, oh, come on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Should we jump in? Yeah. Right, Phil. Anything caught your eye? Yeah, so page, well, first page, but referencing mm. page 119, Escape Reaction, they've added the word targeted into the description as to when you can make a escape reaction. It's in the sentence in terms of just like a unit decided to go down when targeted by HE, but this is a question we hear a lot with regards to can I make an escape reaction from, for example, splash damage and that sort of thing. And whenever you see this on Facebook, whenever you see this question come up at events, the key point is if you're targeted, you are allowed to do a reaction, be that go down, or in this case, be that perform escape reaction. So I'm quite pleased to see if please is the right word to use, the word targeted has been added. Yeah. And to be fair, this is, I think that was quite clear to most players. Yeah. The thing that had muddied the water was in the last FAQ, the wording was just like a unit going down when hit by HE, yeah, yeah, yeah. which isn't how the rules work, muddied the water a little bit. Yeah. So it's nice that we've tidied that up. Yeah. Can we move on to a really exciting thing? Yeah. Now? So most excitingly, yeah. trucks, Every army can have a truck now with a machine gun. Hurrah! Nothing better. The only thing that can make it slightly better yeah. is if it was full 360 pindle. Okay. Is, but, is it full 360 pindle for some of the armies that already get a machine gun on a transport truck? One or two. Okay. Generally, what happens is it's not factored into the points cost, the 360 right. pindle, I don't think, okay. because it's always 15 points for a machine gun upgrade. Yeah. And the ones that are 360 pint will pay 15 points. The ones that are front arc only 50, pay 15 points. Mm -hmm. I think, as a reference, the armies of Germany is forward-facing only. Mm. And so that's fine. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just delighted now it, that to, I can have to a, be fair, a truck. You know, people who play minor nations who haven't been able to access this, it is actually quite significant for them. Mm. I know talking to, to Alan... Alan Wells, it is something that he's often bemoaned about his Bulgarians, and now he gets that opportunity to take his MMG on his truck. Yeah, I'm all over it. I'm loving it. Yeah. I mean, a couple of other transports were added. Nothing, nothing anywhere near as noteworthy. Everyone can have a Jeep now. Everyone can have a tractor now. Everyone can have a horse now. Japanese players, the utility mm -hmm. car actually is worth taking note of because the Kuragani is the four-man transport that the Japanese players take mm. to stick their flamethrower in, but you pay more points for it because you're getting four seats rather than three. So this actually costs now the same as a Jeep. So if you do want to shave some points off and you only need a, a three-person transport to stick your flamethrower plus a single officer, you can now do that as a Japanese player. That's a good tip. That pro, pro tip. Go into a thousand point tournament and you're at a thousand and two points. Drop a seat. <laughs> so that was our all armies yep. options that they've added, which I'm pretty happy with, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that nicely solves it. Then they've 
they've done me dirty here. Oh, okay. In the armies of Germany <laughs> section. I mean, in fairness, yeah. I think this is the correct call. It's just that it happens to negatively affect an army that I use. So yeah. the 250 slash nine, which previously lost the open top in an FAQ. With no change to the points. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. It was a free boost. Yeah. They've now added a five points cost to that. Yes. So you can't have it open topped. It's now no longer open topped ever, but you pay five additional points for it. The reason that has hurt me especially is <laughs> I run the Budapest Recce Platoon, yeah, where yeah. it's basically an infantry platoon. Everything's in transports. Because of that, when you get to sort of 40 points left and you've got no seats left, there's nothing to spend points on. Mm. And so it's like Tetris mm-hmm. building the army where everything has to fit in just the right slot. And so now my exactly a thousand point list is 10 points over yeah. and I can't really drop anything because I've got to drop it in like squad units mm-hmm. or drop it or you drop the squad and the half track. That's a lot of points to replace. And so it, it just makes it a bit fiddly. <laughs> And the reason why it's come in is because they've also fixed the 222, 221, and 223. So that is no longer open topped, but you are paying an extra five points. Yeah. And it's a, it's a nice change because yeah. this was a complaint people were having mm. that they've basically got the exact same turret mm-hmm. on where it's got like the open top, but with the grenade mesh on. Yeah. And so they're saying, well, if the gra- grenade mesh gives you not open top there, why doesn't it give them protection? Mm-hmm. And so I think it's a, it's a nice change. It's, just made my life a bit more fiddly. Yeah. I think you may potentially see 222s appearing more often because they are mm. obviously available now as a plastic kit. You know, since Gentleman's War came out, the, the plastic kit came out. But if you were, previously, if you were given a choice between the 222 and the 259, if you weren't fussed about tracked versus wheeled, you were possibly more likely to go with the 259 because it was closed top, whereas now they're both closed top you might potentially see the 222 more often. What is interesting is it only applies to the Armies of Germany entry for the 222, because the 222, if I'm right, does appear as a unit choice for some of the minor nations, not as an Axis support option, but actually as a unit choice, I think. Mm. Bulk, I, I don't have enough I think it's potentially knowledge to support that. Hungary, <laughs> way. maybe. Someone will know more than me here. Um, on the note of the armies of Germany, actually, mm. the FAQ has just added cheeky little anti-aircraft half track as well. Yeah, which I'm curious on because it's, I mean, it's not a bargain by any means, but equally, it's not hugely expensive. Mm. And you're getting for 75 points, you're getting two machine guns, armor seven, but open topped. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think you're overpaying for it, but I don't think it's a huge bargain. So I think it's it's quite an interesting one. My question is, are they twin MMGs? They're platform, so they're full 360, Mm. but are they twin? It doesn't specify. Now, it would be pretty silly to say that I'm going to fire one, you know, at like two o'clock on a clock face and one at 10 (laughs) o'clock on a clock face, but I'm assuming they are twinned. Yeah, I mean, they're on the same mount, Mm. aren't they, I think? And so, yeah, they're mounted alongside each other on sort of a fixed mount. Mm -hmm. And so I think they're going to have to shoot the same target. It would be nice to have clarity on it, I suppose, in the rules, but it's one of those ones a bit like, do you remember the rotating platform rules where yeah, yeah. it's kind it's of like you look at the model? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think, yeah, they've got to target the same thing. Mm-hmm. But it's a bit like a sort of a Mormon Harrington type deal, isn't it? Or, but I suppose it didn't have recce, which may... If we start seeing loads of air observers... <laughs> so the cynic in me says the reason why they've added it is because their recent 250 box allowed you to mm-hmm. make the 250 slash four i think that's a good reason to add it as any and this also appears for one of the british units later mm. that it's to reflect what's available rather than <laughs> a massive demand from the bolt action playing community saying do you know what we really need a twin mmg half track for the germans yeah well i wouldn't be at all surprised if there was a bit of sort of an outcry for it just because people have bought the the box. Mm. They built this model up and then they go to play it and realize there's, there's no, no rules, for it. rules for it. Yeah. And so actually I think it's quite nice that if you are going to make a model. It, make oh sure yeah. yeah, yeah no, rules. I, I agreed. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's more like horses and bolting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
That's it for the, the new German units. If we skim down to the US, there's nothing to add there. Uh, no, nothing for the US. No. British, so the British do get a new unit, which is the Commando LMG team. Mm-hmm. So 65 points of veteran for two men. You get a Vickers LMG. Now, the points costing is interesting here. So it's 65 points for a veteran, which is the same as buying a veteran MMG, and it counts as a machine gun option for any generic reinforced platoon or any any theatre selector that includes commando squads. It's a team weapon. It gets behind enemy lines, so you can outflank with it if you want to. They're tough fighters because it's a commando one, and because it's the Vickers K, it shoots an extra dice, so it shoots five dice rather than four. Mm-hmm. Going back to the marketing strategy, the recent commando team weapon box that came out in resin included the Vickers K LMG team. And this was one of their metal commando models. So again, I'm wondering if they've now included it in the FAQ because the model is available. And unless you were going to put an LMG Vickers into a commando squad, as well part of your infantry squad selections, you had this team weapon or this, you know, this LMG team, which wasn't necessarily going to see the, the playing field. Yeah, I think probably. I think also... If it didn't exist previously, then if you're running full commandos mm. and you want to bang an MMG in, it's a bit frustrating to not be able to have the commando MMG as an option. Yeah. So if, again, from that perspective, I can totally see why you would throw it in. Mm. It's, it's not it's not game changing anyway. So I think it's no, quite unless, a nice little include. You know, unless you like your little seven man vet squads and then you want to take a you know, little veteran LMG team. It is quite cool, to be fair, to have an LMG team in the MMG slot because you can do the move and fire. So the Germans already have yeah. that option. And you do actually, to be fair, you do actually see the German option, but it's costed differently because it's regular and, and so on. But yeah, no, nice yeah. to have. Yeah. And I think it's a bit of a fragile one with only two men. Yeah. But. You're shooting it like an MMG as well as the other thing with this one, which is cool to be able able to move forward it's and then co- still shoot it like a cool an MMG. It's a cool model as well. Mm. Yeah. It's actually a good addition. Yeah. Okay, in summary, yay, we like that. <laughs> Not just the marketing strategy. There we go. So moving into the armies of France and allies, yeah. there's a nice little historical tidy up on the half-track truck and PZINZ. 302 field car. I don't know what the PZINZ stands for, but the, you've increased the transport capacity to six seats, which actually they haven't increased the points cost. Usually it's two points a seat. And so you're getting a free seat there. Nice. Nice if you need it. I suppose it's good if you want to stick a little five man squad and your officer in as well. Mm-hmm. But really, not a huge game change and change. Just a nice little addition if you are playing the armies of Poland. Yeah. Speaking of the armies of Poland, you can now take a sniper team which is very nice. Yeah. I think we highlighted that as one of the few things that they didn't have access to. Mm. And so it's quite nice that they now do have access to it. Still no Greek flamethrowers. That was something else that's that's been raised in the past by not just on, on our Greek episode. Yeah, hopefully that'll be a little nice little nudge for them. Was there anything else in the armies of France and Allies? Not in the Allies, no. But if we jump across to the other side to mm-hmm. armies of italy in the axis now this is something that uh, actually people have been talking about for a while i've been talking about this for quite a long time in fact i've actually asked an faq question about this exact unit mm-hmm. that was addressed okay and now it's been doubly addressed potentially now it's been doubly addressed so hungarian cavalry sections can now charge Hooray. Hooray. Uh, yeah because originally they had rifles yep. so they couldn't shoot yeah because they weren't the carbines yeah yeah and they weren't allowed to charge. Yeah. And so I had sent off a question and originally they'd amended them to have carbines so that they could at least do something on horseback. Mm-hmm. This is even better because now you've got horses that can actually do something yeah. to the, in the game because you're paying quite a lot for your horses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's nice for them to be able to charge in as well. Now, it's only Hungarians. Do you get Romanian and Bulgarian cavalry units? That's a good question. I think the Bulgarians have the same cavalry rule. Let, let me have a look. The Romanians you do, because they've got a selector called the Romanian Cavalry Troop, so you kind of hope that they did get cavalry. They do. The ca- Romanians definitely do. <laughs> yes, the Romanian Cavalry can't move into contact with an enemy unit whilst mounted. So the Romanians are still suffering the can't charge. They're remaining, not charging. <laughs> Dear me. Yeah, the, the Bulgarians still can't charge. Okay. So it's curious that they've allowed the Hungarians to charge, mm. but not the other two. 
So we need the Bulgarian and the Romanian players out there to make some more noise. Yeah. And let's see that change in the next one. Now, this is where I've noticed one of the, the blunders. Mm-hmm. In the Hungarian cavalry section, they've given them the option for a light machine gun at 20 points. Ah, uh, yeah, this is Panzerfaust. the most expensive Panzerfaust in the game. Panzerfaust yeah. at 10 points. Now, the reason they've made that mistake mm. is because in the armies of Italy and Axisburg, a lot of the Panzerfausts were 10 points. And then everyone complained that everyone else was getting them at five points. Right. And so they addressed it in the FAQ to be five points. And then when they've added this option for the cavalry, they've referenced the original book and not checked their own FAQ there by the looks of things. And so I'm expecting that to be reduced to five points in a future FAQ. Again, it's not a huge game changing thing because your cavalry squad is going to be quite expensive anyway. So an extra five points isn't the end of the world. But it's it would just be nice to have a bit of consistency throughout, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. So, at the start of that entry, Armies of Italy and Axis, in all instances, the cost of the Panzerfaust option will be changed to five points rather than ten points. Right, okay. And then, later on, in the exact same FAQ, page 76, the following options are added. Mm. So, if I add that option, is it then adjusted by the original <laughs> clause at the top of that section of the FAQ? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I add the option that for ten points, and then I adjust it down to five as per the FAQ. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. So that's a bit of a blunder, but I'm hoping it'll be addressed within the next two years in the next FAQ. Mm -hmm. Cool. There are a couple of exciting little vehicles added as well. One more so than the other for me. Okay, so the Italians now get an Armour 9 tank, the P2640, which is a turret-mounted medium anti-tank gun with a coaxial MMG. Fairly standard. Yeah. Bit of it, yeah. 185 points is about right for it. Mm -hmm. It's not going to change the game particularly, but it's nice to have the option for a what is a medium tank in most armies, but is described as a heavy tank for the Italians. <laughs> yeah. And then you get the Fiat 665N Proteto, which is... And this is the one that's exciting me. Okay, so this is a 7-plus armoured carrier, 20 men. You can add mm-hmm. a forward-facing hull-mounted MMG and a forward-facing pintle for plus 15 points. Hold on a moment. So it's 90 points regular. Base let base cost for a seven plus mm-hmm. armored car, which is it tracked or wheeled? Doesn't say it's wheeled, it's wheeled. Okay, mm-hmm. 20 men. How much is a German half track? Is what 89 points? I think it's two, 89 two, for the 251 two, 12 man transport, 12 yeah. man tracked with a forward facing MMG. Okay, anyway, so why is this exciting? I mean, other than the fact if you're playing, if you're playing tank wars as the Italians. This is quite useful. Yeah, I just really like transports that you can load your whole army into. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the fact that it's 20 men in mm. a single transport, I just, I don't know what I'm going to do with it if I did play Italians, mm-hmm. but I know that I definitely would have one. Mm-hmm. And I'd probably put like four squads in it of five men. Yeah. I just rush them up and then they all just would. run out in different directions. Yeah. <laughs> Not to do anything offensive, just to. Because you just can. Just to be quite funny. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but you could stick a so couple that's of why the, I found um, it quite exciting. the engineer squads in with your dual flamethrowers. So. Exactly. Yeah, okay. I mean, it reminded me a bit of the, the British truck where you can add the trailer and put, what was it, 30 men in it? No, it's the it's the three-ton truck that you can increase to have 29 men in, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but from a more tactical perspective, yes, for tank wars... Mm. You could now run your your heavy in inverted commas tanks, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then just put all your troops in this one transport. Armor seven. The other thing, actually, that we didn't mention that is it's closed. Mm, so none that's of that's a huge perk compared yeah, yeah. to the half tracks pinning and all that malarkey. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So I I just I just thought it was a really nice little addition. Yeah, no, it's pretty cool. To be fair, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria get a flying for a team. That's nice. Nice tidy up. I mean, it's yeah. It's one of those things now, I think, where the game is so mature that you want the balance where, like, if if there's sort of reasonable historical reason to have it yeah. and everyone else has it, it feels, just for the sake of completeness, everyone should have access. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. And uh, now the Axis have access. <laughs> <laughs> so that's our, like, additions mm. from to the to the books to the mm-hmm. core armies of books there is the faq then jumps into the actual frequently asked questions mm-hmm. section mm-hmm. before going to the theater books mm-hmm. for an errata which is a weird way to do it to put your core errata to the books then your faq and then your 
your yeah, errata to the the non core books. Yeah, yeah. But jumping into the FAQs, the first one's actually a really interesting one. That yes, I've it is. I've asked not to Warlord, but I've I've sort of thought about myself previously. Where if your artillery piece loses cohesion, <laughs> can you just advance back in so you can still shoot it at minus one? Yeah. Or do you have to do an actual move because? That's a huge difference if you've got like a steward bearing down on you. Yeah. And it's in the open. You might as well take that shot with the advance. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. So, the, you know, the, the old tactic of shooting at an artillery piece, if you get an exceptional, removing that crew member who was keeping the unit, keeping the artillery crew in coherency, what you used to be able to do was, you know, take the middleman out, for example. Suddenly the crew's no longer in coherency. So they have to, the next turn, go back into coherency or they can go down. What this has allowed you to do is to, on an advance, put them back into coherency and obviously fire because it's an advance order rather than having to do a run order to move, in inverted commas, your crew back into coherency. It is actually very significant, to be fair. Yeah, and it's and I think a lot of people were playing this because I think I've seen it ruled this way at tournaments mm. where, because obviously when you pivot that gun, the crew pivot with it mm. and there's nothing that says they have to retain in the exact same formation. Mm. And so I think I have seen it ruled this way, but it's, it's nice to have sort of an actual document that clarifies that that's the way it works. Yeah, definitely, yeah. The next FAQ I thought was sort of just if, a if, nice clarifier yeah. if, if, you've, if you didn't realise it, but it, it's quite clear from the rules so we'll not dwell on it too long basically it just says that when you charge into a vehicle it doesn't take a pin from yeah. just for, because it's hitting close quarters which, because it's an assault yeah but it does take a pin from any effect of the damage if the damage is if the vehicle successfully damaged yep yeah, that's straightforward which is how close quarters has always worked as the same with infantry on infantry so yeah i suppose if you're a newer player it might be a nice clarifier for you yeah, yeah. but then there's another one that i thought was fairly sort of <laughs> the immediate following question yeah was sort of like quite a bit of an obvious mechanic that people have been using for a long time in Bolt yeah, Action. Yeah, yeah. But I suppose it nicely sort of clarifies it for it, new it, players. I guess it's just acknowledging that, yes, you pivot from the centre of the vehicle, and yes, it does mean that depending on which direction you pivot and move in, you may gain one to two inches depending on how big your vehicle is. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's a double-edged sword as well because you're measuring your range for shooting from the hull. Yes. And so when you push your Churchill forward, let's say, because that's the longest thing I can think mm -hmm. of right now. <laughs> um, it pivots, it's 90 degrees. Yes, you've gained an inch and a half, let's say, mm -hmm. in sideways movement, but you've also lost that inch and a half in, a in its foot. Yeah, a certain direction, yeah, yeah. And it's shooting in that direction yeah. that it originally started in. Yeah, yeah. And so, and this is actually why when you're moving your vehicles, you really should do the move, do the turn, do mm -hmm. the move. If you're looking to maximize your move, mm -hmm. a lot of players I see just bend the tape measure. So they'll, they'll just sort of snap the tape measure to 90 degrees yeah. and, and that gives them the final position. And that's fine, but it does mean you're, you're losing your, yeah, you're losing an inch or two potentially. Yeah. 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 And so it, one to bear in mind. Now the next one, infantry and buildings. It's a this, very good before question. Before you go into it, I would like to. Before you give your analysis, I'd like to say this for me was an absolute blunder of a response. But I'll let you jump yeah, in. Yeah, it's a really good question. And it's something that I've absolutely asked myself of, of people at events, of us TOs. We've talked about it in different groups I'm in and so on. So if an infantry unit is in a building, does the one inch gap apply? If so, does it apply from the edge of the building? Is it only applicable inside the room? What's going on? So really good question, and, and it is an absolutely valid one, because if it does apply, you've got this nice little bubble appearing around your building, and depending on where you place the unit, you know, let's say you've got a unit outside the building and a unit inside the building, you can start absolutely cutting down lines of advance. You can stop assaults in, into certain parts of the, of the board, because that bubble that if it, if, you know, depending on how they answer it, that bubble has suddenly just created this, like, no-go zone. Mm -hmm. how did they answer it johnny well they give an answer that isn't really an answer if i'm honest yeah it says in general it's good practice to keep units at least one inch away from any building they have not assaulted to make things clear yeah now if they had said keep units one inch from buildings yeah that's fine because we can play to that mm -hmm. if they'd said the one inch gap doesn't matter for buildings ever that's we fine can we play can play to that, that. Yeah. But this is an answer that isn't an answer. Yeah, yeah. Because you're saying, kind of just do what you want. And that's not what you want from a company that's putting out a game that they want everyone to play and like 
have tournaments because yeah. that really drives the community. Mm-hmm. You can't really just be wishy-washy with the rules. And the players, I mean, we've seen plenty of rules go one way or the other. Mm. You get a little bit of people not complain about it, having a bit of grumble. But ultimately, people just want clarity. Yeah, That's yeah, all yeah. they want yeah. from you. And so it's really frustrating when we have things like this that just say, roll for it. It's good practice. Like, <laughs> yeah. Just decide one way or the other, please. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, from my perspective, I actually think the answer isn't the right answer anyway. Okay. Because it could ruin some games. So say you've built like a really thematic sort of like British village mm. and you've got a sort of an alley between two a mm-hmm. terrace of houses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You now can't run down that alley because that alley's only, let's say, two and a half inches wide. <laughs> Anywhere you place a model in the alley is within an inch of a house. Mm-hmm. So that alley becomes redundant. And so I would say just ignore the one inch gap for buildings. Or if you are going to do it, do it exclusively for openings. Hmm. I, I guess this will be one where if it comes up at an event, the TO needs to make a decision one way or the other. And, and it's yeah. going to be one of those moments of here's the TO's decision. We accept it and we move on. Absolutely. I mean, the other question is that leads from this that I've just thought of is, can I shoot within an inch of a building? (laughs) Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, again, now needs clarifying from this answer. I don't know. I would say probably not heavy weapons. And I think you could, again, apply my ruling that you can't shoot within an inch of an opening if there's a friendly squad inside of it with rifles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if there's not an opening because you can't hurt them, Perhaps yeah. you could allow it. Mm-hmm. But again, just needs a little bit of clar- clarity. Yeah. The next one, Mountaineers, Assault and Through Cover. Did it go first? That's just, you know, that that's just, it's it's not clarifying anything. It was it was already in the rules. Mountaineers, if depending on the wording of the Mountaineer rule, but if a Mountaineer ignores rough ground, if you charge through rough ground and you ignore it, it's not rough, it's open, therefore you go first. Yeah. Nice Moving summary. On. Yeah. The next one. I tell you what, Phil, why don't you read us through the next one? <laughs> and then we'll discuss it because it's a really weird one. Okay, so next one, it's to do with armoured platoons. So if my army can take up to three bikes with sidecars as a single armoured car entry, so for example, British and the French, can I take 15 such bikes in a single armoured platoon? So where you've got five slots for armoured vehicles and with the, the ruling that you can take three for one, mm-hmm can you then take 15 the response yes you can but note that you must give the command vehicle rule to all three bikes purchased as the platoon's hq slot so that's going to be a 75 points cost to do that yeah well just don't do that take 12 and then another vehicle make that your command vehicle well that's what i was just thinking the problem with that answer is well what if i take 12 and then my command slot i just take one bike (laughs) <laughs> yeah so because yeah. it because do, you don't have to purchase three bikes per slot you can purchase up to up three to three yeah true yeah and so i suppose what you do i mean they're so cheap anyway they're like 35 points each and so you could at 1000 points you could have dual platoon yeah. 26 bikes i mean this is one of those moments of just because you can doesn't mean you should because <laughs> you have to ask the question why would you do this obviously it depends on you know what you're playing who you're playing what kind of stuff but yeah moving on i mean i'm game for it that is it's the kind of thing you would like to see well it's a it's it's a really fast army yeah which is really fun to play generally because you sort of whizzing around especially when they're so fragile because even rifles can hurt them Mm. it means that you've got a real sort of unique strength but equally Mm. you're very weak and so that's why i quite like it as a force it has a very specific niche but if you're playing armored platoon versus armored platoon and you've taken a bunch of soft skin lmg bikes and your opponent's got three armor eight or nine tanks you're not going to get you know it won't be be the greatest game you've ever experienced it'll be a bit of a head scratcher won't it because as you've correctly highlighted, it's going to be very hard to hurt their tanks. Mm. And so it's going to be a fun one in that regard. But there's a lot of sort of shenanigans, and you're going to have to play in a very thoughtful way because there are shenanigans where you can sort of create a car park around their tank to limit its movement. <laughs> yeah. And then obviously as soon as it turns to shoot you, the you one that recce. it shoots at wreckies away. Uh, it's, like the, it's like how you use cavalry. You know, when you've got your officer, officer on the horse, then you can really, you know, stop 
stop people's vehicles pivoting and firing at infantry squads. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay. So for me, it's one that if I didn't have to build and paint 26 motorcycles <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. for an army that I'm probably going to use once yeah. and then put on the shelf until I c- until sort of it feels new again, it's certainly one that I'd like to try. Yeah. So the next one, last but one in, in the FAQ section, if a squad with two flamethrowers in it fires and hits the target with both, does the squad being hit take two lots of D3 plus one pins and take two morale checks or one of each? Straight answer is no, it just takes one because, as you know, if a unit is firing with multiple different weapons at a single target, you only ever take one lot of pins. And also from the previous FAQ where it talks about, it was it was the entry about fanatics and stubborn, where it basically said the flame for a morale check replaces the morale check for if you lose more than 50%, 50% or more of casualties in one, one round of firing. Yeah, and that's coherent with FAQ. That isn't no. how I read the rules originally, that no. FAQ rule, and it was one that I was a bit irked by. But now that that is the FAQ rule, and at least that's consistent with Yes, that, that is absolutely consistent, yeah. And it's nice that that's clarified, because mm. we are starting to see dual flamethrower units, um, yeah, 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 especially yeah, in the campaign books. Italians and US can do it, can't they? Yeah, in the yeah, yeah. Mariana book. Exactly, yeah. yeah. The question that arises for me, though, is if I have a tank with two... HE shells. Yes. So like a Lee, for example, can shoot yeah, two yeah, HE. Yeah, yeah. And it shoots one target, both hits. With both HE, yep. Yeah. Does it get pins no, from both HE it's, shells? it's a single model firing at a target unit. You only ever take one lot of pins. And I'm pretty sure the wording is you take the most amount of pins. So if you hit it with a mm-hmm. two-inch template and a one-inch template with your Lee... Yeah, because you've got a two-inch HE and a one-inch HE. You're going to take the D3 pins. Well, you're going to roll for your D3 pins and then roll for your D2 pins. And then you take the highest amount. But if that is the case, then surely in this case, you should roll two D3 and pick the highest. It doesn't say that you only roll once. It just says you only take D3 plus one pins. And you only take one test. Mm. So I think, where where have you, was it in the FAQ you've seen that? high explosive thing or is it in the main rule no book? I'm, I'm sure that's a, one of the main rule book things mm. that a unit a, a unit only ever takes one set of pins even if it's hit by different types of weapons from the same target that's part of the core mechanic oh yeah absolutely like you shoot but usually we're thinking of sort of like machine guns so the, the turret machine gun and the whole machine gun mm. where you've got things that can inflict different amounts of random pins mm. It so rarely comes up that I actually can't recall seeing it in the rules myself. One moment, please. Units hit by multiple HE hits like this only suffer a single batch of multiplied pin markers, not multiples of them. For example, they would suffer D2 pins even if hit by two or more HE hits from a single automatic cannon and not D2 pins per hit. So I guess by abstraction, if you're hit by a one-inch HE template, which is D2 pins, and a two-inch template, which is a D3, so like the Lee, you're only going to take one lot of pins, and you're going to take the highest amount of pins, so you should roll both. You'd roll the D3 first, because if you get a three, that's that's you don't need to roll your D2. But let's say you roll your D3 pins, you only get one, you should then roll your D2 pins in case you roll a two. I agree with with your interpretation however i don't see where it says you apply the highest like i don't i don't see in the rule where it yeah, says I, 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 no, if, that's because i don't enough. think they've actually thought about the mul- like the different types i think the multiple he rules only cover the same type no i don't i don't think it looks i don't to be fair i don't think it explicitly says that's what you do you'd like to say that common sense prevails but yeah, again, it's just one of those things where I think you need clarity because if you're at a tournament, then it's nice to know what's going to happen if I shoot both those HE H- mm. shells at the same target. Am I going to get to roll both set of pins and pick the and highest? the highest, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or do I just get to roll one set? And again, whatever that decision is, then affects this flamethrower ruling because if the two high explosives both get to roll, then surely both flamethrowers get to roll and then you pick the highest. And so I think that could do with a little bit extra clarity. I mean, mm. you could apply this like the 
twin auto cannon version where because it's the same number of pins you do just roll the one d2 so actually i think on this you roll one d3 you apply the, those pins plus the one do your flame test it's done but my yeah. new question for the next faq is <laughs> <laughs> what happens if you get hit by multiple he causing shots from one from one yeah from one unit yeah yeah, yeah. then what happens and so yeah so the question if my Lee shoots a single unit and hits with both high explosive shells with different number of pins, yeah, do I just do the D3 or do I roll both? How do I calculate? Yeah. Yeah, yeah fair point. I think I would rule just roll the D3. Mm. Moving on, though, tank mm. riders, don't put them on if there's a prelim. Yeah, do, do, not, do not deploy them if there's prep bombardment. Yeah, yeah. So actually, I thought this was a, a good clarification if that's the right mm-hmm. word to use, the answers are already there. They've 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 appeared in other FAQ responses in terms of how do you work out when a, when a target can react from prep bombardment, from artillery fire, and from airstrikes. It just nicely brings it all together, which essentially is the point at which it becomes a target is the point at which a unit has to do something. So in the case of the tank riders, in prep bombardment, if it's in your deployment zone, it's a target. Therefore, you need to react before you roll to see if it gets hit. If it's been hit by an artillery bombardment and it's within the, the range of the artillery bombardment, it's a target. Therefore, you need to react. And then likewise for the airstrike, as soon as the type of aircraft attacking the plane is determined, you know whether or not it's going to become a target, depending on the type of plane. And therefore, it needs to react. Absolutely. It also highlights one of the misplayed rules I see with tank riders because they don't come up that often. And I do sort of mm. see people playing where you have to get the hit before they get off, but it's not. It's just as soon as you start shooting at it, before you roll the hit, everyone disembarks. Yeah. And that's why if you know if you're playing against someone with tank riders and you've got an infantry squad with rifles, you shoot at the tank. You can't hurt the tank, but you force the dismount for the tank riders. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a good job and, for if you've got the free forward artillery observer for the Brits, and he's mm. already done his fire thing. You might as well shoot his one rifle shot or whatever yeah, weapon at, you've given at him. the tank to dismount the tank riders. Yeah, yeah. and then because I believe the emergency disembark and go down, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a normal disembarking so, rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's fun. so if, you, if you're taking, you know, your, your engineers, yeah, you know, your tooled up engineers with body armor as tank riders. Oh, sorry. You just had to disembark. You're going to spend a long time moving six inches. The next FAQ was quite a nice clarification, I thought. Oh, yes, the um, Tiger Fear one. Everyone loves Tiger Fear. Yes, so this is one that we've highlighted as being inconsistent with the core rules, where when mm. you're on a vehicle, you just don't get to interact with anything else on the table. It's like you're not on the table. And in the previous FAQs, they had this weird thing where you could see the Tiger from inside the truck, which meant your bazooka didn't want to get out of the truck. Because he was so scared of the tiger, he didn't want to get out and attack it. <laughs> but equally, he didn't want to do anything else, like run away from yeah. it. And so what was he supposed to do? And so it's really nice. Now, if you're in a transport, they've clarified that passengers do not have line of sight to the tiger or to anything else. And so mm-hmm. anything in a transport can't see anything on the table. Nice to clarifies that. The only thought with that is I had used that previous FAQ rule and that you could see the tiger to justify vengeance inside a transport. Yeah, I was going to mention that, but vengeance doesn't require line of sight. It just requires you to be within 12 inches. And and this came up last year at the Welsh Nationals. In the, you know, the question is whether or not that unit inside the, the, the Bren carrier, for example, can measure, if it's taken a pin already, can measure 12 inches from the Bren to see if it's within 12 inches to try and take a pin off. I mean, I... You could argue it both ways. You, know, you could argue it that the unit's not on the table. So it's not within 12. Units yep. and transports are not on the table. It does say that in the rule book somewhere. Mm-hmm. Therefore, it's not within 12. But then absolutely, the previous FAQ ruling about tank fear was like, aha, but <laughs> <laughs> if tiger fear can be caused, give, given to passengers, then by extraction, yeah. vengeance can. Yeah. Because also when they added the tiger fear having a range, that was mm. the thing that, for me, really justified vengeance working in a transport. Because yeah, if you can yeah. measure range for tiger fear inside a transport, you can measure range for vengeance in a transport. Yeah. Now I think that probably needs an FAQ answer to say vengeance either does or doesn't work in a transport. Yeah. Is there a little vengeful bubble going on <laughs> around the transport? That's what we want to know. There's not a lot going on in the FAQs. It looks like most of the other books 
people have had their questions answered previously until yeah. we get to the partisans and a nice mm. little tidy up i thought this one mm-hmm. so partisan bombs if a partisan bomb is placed inside a building do you measure six inches from the token or six inches from the edge of the building can they bring the building down and then the response is if the bomb is placed inside the building it's only tested for if an enemy unit enters the building no six inch range is used if it detonates, it can indeed bring down the building. Quite a nice little clarifier, I thought that. Yeah. My gut response would have been, if you stick it inside the building, it only detonates when you enter the building. I've, I would have gone with that. But yeah. that's, I don't play partisans, and I don't think I've ever had to ask the question, but that would have been my gut response. Yeah, it's. I think the, the thing that meant it needed to be clarified is because the multiple rocket launcher yeah, systems yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. were measuring six inches from the edge of the building if they choose the building as a target. And so I could see why you might think that, oh, I'll put the bomb in there and I'll get an extra six-inch range. But I, I would have wanted to play it the way you said, where, I mean, exactly as the FAQ has ruled now, yeah. that obviously if you've booby-trapped the building, you need to go in the building to set off the, the booby trap. So moving to the campaign books... Naval observers, we just get clarification of the points there. Yeah, and it hasn't changed since the last FAQ. The only thing that's changed is it's gone from the specific entry in a specific yeah, book. Yeah, all, all books. Yeah, yeah, all books, which, again, just a nice clarifier. So we, I don't think we need to dwell there, do we? No. Case Blue gets a few updates. So we get some points recosting for bicycles. The Slovakian Army Special Rules, quite rightly, it basically says because you can only take the Slovakian Army from that book. It, those special rules apply whenever you play Slovakians, not just for the theatre selectors in that book, which is different to what the wording is for Italian, Romanian, Hungarians. Stragglers, you can take them if you so choose for, for a Romanian selector. I think it's nice that they've added that just for, because quite often you get these things where they just get omitted from a theatre selector and you think, oh, why haven't you put that in? So yeah, that's yeah, quite nice. True. But the big one? Uh, the big one is the improvised AT, which basically clarifies that it only applies to heavy weapons, i.e. with a penetration value so no longer small no no longer small arms for those of you that thought it could apply with less than plus three pen it hasn't clarified the question <laughs> we had about the heavy auto cannon or l- low velocity anti-tank yeah, gun. yeah yeah what point does does plus three become not plus three yeah, yeah. and i think so i'm going to stick with my rule on that that a low velocity anti-tank gun would never benefit from this rule yeah but a nice clarifier so D-Day, US sector, you get some subtle changes to some theatre selectors. Empire and Flames, you get a subtle select, uh, change to the, the Japanese option for the Jeeps. Fortress Budapest, you get some clarification about parachute assault squads. Just where they can be used, basically. Yeah. Tough Gut, we're not going to go through all of this, but there's a lot of changes to Tough Gut. Yeah, and they're mainly just sort of like, for want of a better word, admin errors so things like points cost slightly out of whack and just things like options not quite being in the right place and things like that so i absolutely agree i don't think it's i don't think it'd be very entertaining for us just basically to read the corrections on a few numbers here and there yeah Um, but you're right there's a lot isn't there there is a lot and there's yeah pretty much nearly all the scenarios get some form of rewording as well Mm. yeah but there is a big change in there (laughs) there is which clarifies something that we highlighted has been very unclearly worded in my opinion previously where we had a we had to have a philosophical debate about what the word adjacent meant previously uh yes this is the ball ward <laughs> yeah mm, it is clear now yep so it you know it's a heavy charge you can only use it once per game <laughs> it does indeed go off of a big ban that should really be italicized it should anytime be, yeah. there's yeah. fluff just put it in italics please <laughs> so that people don't think that that might be a rule so we get the clarification that when you fire it or when it goes off you place the four inch template in contact with the center of the front hole of the vehicle so there was ambiguity about in front of i think before it's now in front of touching the the center of the vehicle it tells you how you get away which is execute a reverse move straight back and then it tells you exactly what is hit by that template so any model hit by the template counts as being hit by a heavy howitzer except that the pen is plus five and units in buildings suffer 4d6 hits instead including the buildings itself including the buildings itself. so if you clip the building Mm -hmm. 
you got a very good chance of bringing that building down, which is the intention of the vehicle originally. So that's was what it was for, yeah. So yeah. it's really yeah. nice that they've done that. Yeah, buildings, fortifications, and so on. The one word to note mm. is it must be successfully ordered to advance to do this mm-hmm. because it does have its funky rules where oh, it can malfunction. It can malfunction and, and things, yeah, yeah. And so you have to do a successful advance in order to do yes. this. I mean, it makes it interesting mm. and it's nice and clear now so that's good yes i'm not sure it's an auto include in your tank slot no it's pretty cool i, I would like to see some if you're running a thematic event and, and you know it wasn't just in in italy that these things were used but it it would be cool to see them at you know, a slightly more thematic event definitely yeah and if, if it hits it goes off it's gonna it's gonna do a lot of damage yeah but equally the counterpoint is if you allow it to hit you, something's gone wrong. Something, something's gone wrong prior to that point. Yeah. It's a bit like the the lunch mines for Japanese, isn't it? Mm. If you manage to take out a vehicle with one of those, something's gone wrong up before that point. Yeah. I suppose tactically what you could potentially do is stick this fella in outflank, <laughs> run on yeah. with your last dice of the turn yeah. so that you're an inch away from the enemy. Like maybe it's a truck with a unit in or something, something tasty like that. And then pray for first dice next turn. So that they don't pin you out and then successfully reverse. Yeah. And then the rest of it is Mariana, just a bit of clarification about the canister round. So New Guinea, just a bit of clarification about the Japanese scouts. So it's brought it in line with the entry from Empire of Flames, which is that any man may exchange their rifle for an SMG for plus three points. New Guinea originally, it was only only one person could do that, whereas Empire of Flames, all three could do that. Yeah, which... I thought that was a bigger deal than it was because I thought previously we didn't have access to all SMG scout squads, but it turns out it's just a bit of a, a tidy up. Yeah. And then the final one, bit of tidy up is Western Desert. Got just using the correct terminology for the Alphaclung group vehicles and likewise the SAS infantry section. Yeah. So all in all, I think quite generally quite a nice tidy up from the FAQ. Yeah, as as we said at the start, there's no major like, oh my God, where did that come from? Or really, they wrote that? That's completely <laughs> not what they said last time. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, some recostings and some clarifications in, in you know, in a few bits, some uh, some nice new new units for general use. And yeah, it's all right, isn't it? Yeah, not bad. I think there's still a couple more things to tidy up, but hopefully we'll get there eventually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if this has inspired you to get a truck, a utilities car, an artillery tractor, or a horse-drawn limber for your army, you might want to check out the links in the description for Firestorm Games and Wayland Games, because you'll get a great deal, and it'll give us a bit of money back for the pod. Indeed. As ever, thank you for listening. Please do share, like, and subscribe. Ta-ta for now. Ta-ta for now. Mm-hmm.